Thank you. Um, so yeah, universal design audit of disability service provision. A couple of years ago, we started introducing universal design for learning and the social model of disability at McGill University in Montreal. We actually started that four years ago. And um, we've been going to conferences promoting universal design for learning, talking about universal design for learning a lot. But then on the way back from one of the conferences, we actually sat on the plane and said, we promote it, we talk about it, but what about our own services? And what about the way that we provide services to students? And we asked us those questions. Um, how can universal design for learning and universal design actually contribute to create accessible, inclusive campuses beyond the classroom? Because so much that we've been doing as disability service providers is actually look at classrooms and look at classroom environments and the way students learn. But we didn't start looking at service provision, um, provision of general services, workshops, for example, everything that we do as service providers. What barriers do we actually create as disability service providers? We we'll always talk about barriers that um, course instructors and teaching staff create in classrooms, but what about ourselves? And how can we actually apply the tools of universal design for learning to a service environment? And how can we use those tools in order to reduce barriers and increase access for our students? So this is the outline um, for the short presentation. So I'll be um, talking about the context because universal design implementation is always contextual. So you always have to consider the context that you're in. Um, I quickly introduced the two theoretical um, frameworks and concepts um, that um, the audit is based on, some practical considerations and our working hypothesis. And then I go into the audit um, areas, explain the barriers that we identified and the solutions that we came up with. Yes. More into okay. So McGill University is located in Quebec, Montreal. And um, at large, we have 39,500 students, um, 20, um, 27,000 undergraduate students, and 10,000 graduate students and a large number of international students, 9,500 international students. Um, you can see that when we talk about diversity and when we talk about diversity at McGill, we do not only talk about, uh, and universal design for learning, we do not only talk about students with disabilities, but we talk about students from different cultural backgrounds, and Montreal is a bilingual city, so we do have a lot of English second language speakers as well. So there are quite a few students at McGill um, who have French as their first language, and they experience barriers similar, similar to barriers that students experience with disabilities as well. So our international students come from 20 countries. Um, we have around 1,700 academic staff, so when we go out to do workshops, um, we talk to a lot of faculties um, and a lot of academic staff. So the Office for Students with Disabilities um, has 10 staff members. We have two access advisors, um, one learning resources advisor. Um, I'm currently the acting director. We have two um, access technologists, and then we have um, exam coordinators and a person who's working the front desk. Um, around 1,700 students are currently registered with our services which constitutes 4.4% of the McGill student population. So that's quite high. And I'll show you a graph later, which will show you the increase of numbers in students registered. Our mandate is the inclusion of diverse learners and promoting universal design for learning and the social model of disability. So those are some of the current trends currently in our office. And you can see how the student number in the past eight years has tripled. And um, yeah, it's just a huge, huge increase. And um, we're not getting more staff. So we're also currently experiencing barriers and challenges when it comes to serving our students and our student population. <coughs> in terms of disability, uh, disability categories, um, as you can see, Mental health, 27% um, really constitutes the largest um, number, numbers of students registered. And with mental health, um, 
I mean, there's depression, there's anxiety, um, bipolar, schizophrenia, so there's really a whole range of mental health disabilities um, that we see on campus. It's closely followed by students with attention deficit disorder at 14%, learning disabilities at 13%, multiple impairments um, at 17%, chronic impairments 15%, and only a very, very small numbers, number of students have actually what we call traditional disabilities. Um, so visual impairments, motor impairments, or hearing impairments. This also means that the largest number of students have what we call invisible disabilities. So the increase in student numbers, as well as um, the variety and complexity of diagnosis that we see at McGill, has basically um, led us to rethink the way we provide services to students. Um, it's also a question of sustainability, because with 1,700 students, we were wondering um, are the um, administrative processes and procedures that we're going through, um, do we create more work for ourselves as well? Does it create barriers for students, but does it at the same time create barriers for us as service providers as well? So do we actually do more work than we actually have to do? Part of the rethinking um, and introducing new frameworks was that we turned to the social model of disability. And it has been on our website, um, we've mentioned it, but um, we never really looked at implementing the social model. So what became pretty apparent right from the beginning was that although we were talking about the social model, um, we actually didn't really implement it. We talked about it, but we didn't really act according to it. And I, I don't know how familiar you are with the social model of disability, but because there are probably um, different levels of knowledge in the room, I'll just quickly explain what it is. So disability service provision um, has um, in the past been addressed by the medical model of disability. So students come up, uh, um, students contact the office, they have to submit documentation, um, they get assessed, and then we put in place accommodations. And the, the medical model of disability really focuses on the individual as the problem. While the social model of disability really views um, the disabling situation, says that the disabling situation comes from the interaction between an individual with an impairment and the society. Um, the individual has a limitation, a functional limitation, or an impairment, but the disabling situation is created by an environment that is inaccessible. And if we look at the social model, it really empowers all of us, because all of us are able to change environments, to make environments more accessible. So therefore, this immediately appealed to us as a model that we want to use and implement. And then we learned about universal design for learning, which for us really um, gives us the tools to create those environments which are accessible. It gives us the tool to remove barriers. And universal design for learning has three main principles, multiple means of representation, multiple means of action and expression, and multiple means of engagement. And I think David Rose really sp spoke in length um, to those three principles. It also says that practices or the curriculum can enable or disable users and students. And it aims to remove barriers in the learning environment or in the environment in general. And um, as I said, we're looking at disability service provision, so it can remove barriers there as well. And it focuses on the conception of environments which give all students equal opportunity to learn or to participate. So for us, it was really looking at participation. How can we get students into the office? How can we um, promote ourselves to students and get students into the office so that they're no longer afraid of signing up with the disability services office, being afraid of stigma, or just being connected um, with our office in any way? So why a UDL audit of disability service provision? And I said, we had an increase in numbers, we have the complexity of diagnosis, and we've always been looking at the physical environment and how we can reduce barriers in the physical environment, but we haven't really been looking at interactions. What barriers do we create when we interact with our students? 
what barriers do we create in our interviews, in our appointments with um, students, for example. So the paradigm shift from the medical model to the social model. There was a disparate, uh, disparity between external campus messaging and internal practices. As I said before, talking about UDL, but not really doing it. Asking instructors to do it, but not really doing it ourselves. We're lobbying for systemic change. So if we're looking at systemic change, we cannot only look at the classroom, we have to look beyond the classroom. Um, many environments can create barriers, and it's not sufficient to just advocate for UDL within the classroom. And all services and programs offered by universities, if we look at um, orientation for first-year students, if we look at residents, for example, they all can create barriers. So it was really important for us to start looking at identifying those barriers as well. So our working hypothesis we did not really adopt a narrow definition of universal design for learning because it's all about flexibility. So for us, it was also about using it in a flexible way and adapting it to the way that the office was working. Um, the basis was that disability is a result of environmental barriers and that we want to remove those barriers. That practices can enable or limit equal participation and that we're looking at an environment-focused approach. So we're really looking at what can we change in the environment, within the office, in our daily interactions with um, students in order um, to create accessible environments. And what tools do we need to do this? So what did we do, actually, and what does it entail? What does a UD audit entail? So first of all, we're looking at identifying barriers. So that's the first question that we asked ourselves. And um, all st we included all staff members and basically said, look at your daily practices, look at what you're doing, and try to identify barriers that you create for yourselves and for students. So everyone in the office was basically involved in that process. And we thought that this was very important because if you're just trying to enforce something on your staff, you do not really get the backup and the involvement that you need. We did not use a checklist or a specific grid. You can often find this on the internet, especially when it comes to um, physical environments. We're just going for the largest possible accessibility that we could get. Um, our goal was to develop or redesign processes, practices, and procedures according to the principles of UDL. We're hoping to implement inclusive practices. And another thing that we found on the go was that UDL is really a progressive exploration and transformation. So thinking that if you start incorporating UDL all of a sudden or in a couple of months, you will have a fully accessible, fully universally designed environment or classroom is not really happening. Up until today, we're still working on creating more accessible services and implementing more and more UDL tools. We defined the following areas, or we had a couple more, but I thought that these were um, the most important ones. So we looked at our administrative processes and procedures, especially exams and documentation guidelines. We looked at user interface, so initial interview, what do we say, how do we talk to students, what kinds of, what language do we use. Um, we looked at our mission statement, and we looked at faculty resources. Administrative processes, um, and especially exam procedures. You have to know that students who are registered with the office and receive extra time as an accommodation, for example, um, need to sign up. Um, if they want to write exam with us or they needed to sign up in the past to write exams with us. And in order to sign up for your exams, to register for your exams, we used all print-based materials, so print, one of the biggest barriers um, in the classroom and for students in general. So that was one, one big barrier that we identified. Then the students were required to physically visit the office, to come pick up the exam forms and drop them off. And then we had multiple deadlines for exam registration. Um, creates a lot of barriers for students with ADHD, for example, who are not very good with deadlines anyway. 
So what we did in order to remove those barriers was, in terms of multiple means of representation, we created online forms. Um, so if students want to use a print version, they could print the online form. But mo almost all students now just simply use the online form. The online form is accessible. It can be used um, with screen readers. Um, and students can basically do it from home, wherever they want to, as, as long as they have access to internet. So exam registration for midterms goes through online forms only. It also removed the need to physically visit the office. And in Montreal, we have a lot of snow in the winter, so not only for students with physical impairments, but in general, it's just so much easier to not trying to make it to like 50 centimeters of snow at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, it provides students with the option to use adaptive technologies with online forms, such as screen readers, for example. Students with visual impairments, a lot of problems when they came in, tried to use the print-based material. Um, we pushed back um, the deadlines to register for midterms, so we're now at a five-day deadline. Um, so up to students can register to write the exams or the midterms with us um, up to five days before the actual exams. We still need that time because we need to um, contact um, faculty to send us the exams. And for final exams, what we did is that we completely removed the necessity to register for exams at all. So all students who are registered with the office are automatically registered to take all their final exams with us. For each and every single student, we provide a space um, and um, a nice environment to basically take the exam. And students can decide the day of the final exam if they rather want to go and write with the class or if they want to come and write with the office. So it's no, they no longer have to decide, have to go through all the administrative procedures that students who do not have disabilities do not have to go through. So we really remove that red tape for, for our students. Um, and we also created a lot of videos explaining how to use those online forms. Documentation guidelines, another big, big barrier. Um, and really, really tied into the medical model of disability. So at the beginning, all students, or back then, all students were required to actually submit valid medical documentation before they could even get an appointment with an access advisor. We completely removed that. All students can come to the office and just explore what we have to offer. Um, we also constantly asked for updated documentation, especially when it came to mental health impairments. Um, another big, big barrier for students. Um, learning disability assessments, for example. Um, some universities ask every five years to get an, uh, to get an updated um, psychoeducational evaluation. It just creates so many, especially socioeconomic barriers for students as well. Um, and barriers that, as I said before, other students just don't experience. So what we did is, as I said, we completely re removed the requirement of having documentation when you come to the office. And we now follow the AHEAD documentation gu uh, guidelines, AHEAD in the United States. Um, we um, also provide temporary accommodations. So if students do not have a psychoeducational evaluation, but if after a discussion with the access advisor, we decide that it is very likely that the student does have a learning disability, we'll provide them with temporary accommodations so that they have to enough time to get their psychoeducational evaluation and still have access to accommodations. Students do no longer need to submit any updated medical documentation. So once on file, it's on file. And we provide emergency financial aid for students who don't have the financial um, means um, to pay for a psychoeducational assessment. Um, user interface in general, we found that we were using a lot of print-based material whenever we were trying to distribute information to our students. And on the website, we found a lot of language that was actually associated with the medical model and not the social model of disability and universal design for learning. Um, so we're now providing a lot of information in digital version instead of print or in digital version and in print. Um, we're using a lot of online forms. And we went through a whole website and completely 
um, redrafted our mission statement, our mandate, and um, are also using the technology uh, terminology. I'll skip the, the video. And then initial interviews, um, formally called intakes. Um, so also very medical, often created a barrier for the students, just the name that we call it an intake. And it was really a terminology that gives a, diagnosis, a diagnostic perspective and has to do with labeling. The first thing that we would usually ask students when they would come to the office and we would sit down is, what's your problem or what can I help you with? Another barrier in terms of help, we're the experts, we're trying to help you and to provide help instead of looking at the environment. The interior room design, the same. It was very much like in a doctor's office where we sit behind the desk and the student sits in front of the desk and we have that type of communication. So what we did is um, we integrated Skype um, as a technology so students do no longer have to come to the office to get their initial appointments as we call them now. Um, it especially reduces barriers for students with um, social anxiety, depression, um, students who don't really want to um, leave the room or the apartment. Um, when we sit down with a student, we always use um, technology. So we'll walk them through websites, um, we'll show them pictures, we'll draw graphs if necessary. And um, at the end of every appointment, um, students will get a summary with all essential information um, that we talked about during um, the appointment via email. And it's very, very helpful. We got a lot of positive feedback. Um, and we're trying to create a really safe space. We now have round tables um, where we really give the student the opportunity to talk to us on an equal level. Uh, the language and terminology that we're using is also aligned now with the social model. So instead of talking about problems, um, challenges, or help, we're talking about um, barriers. So we're asking students about what barriers do you actually experience in your educational environment and what can we do to remove those barriers? So the, the discussion much more focuses on the environment and less on what can we do in order to fix you so that you fit into the system. We're really looking at how can we change the system. And then we created faculty resources because we thought um, when we're talking about UDL and the social model, um, we should less be talking to students about what they should do, but what we should actually do is talk more to faculty about what they should be doing in order to include those students in the general classroom setting. And we actually freed 50% of advising hours to go to faculty, individual faculty um, consultations. So in terms of the outcomes, um, first of all, we have reduced a lot of administrative processes and procedures for us. It's much, much more sustainable what we're currently doing. It's a really systemic approach to issues of access and inclusion. Um, we really were able to remove a lot of barriers and get more and more students to come into the office and talk to us. Um, it's increased sustainability in terms of human resources. We're actually really able to take care of 1,700 students with the staff that we had five years ago to take care of only 500 students. And they're really, really sustainable social practices as well. And everyone who interacts with the services benefits. And um, it had such a great impact that McGill residences are have also conducted a UD audit and a UDL audit of how they provide services to students and what they do for students. And in general, it was a win-win situation. We surveyed our student population and we had a 92% um, satisfaction of all students who are registered with the office, which is pretty good. Thank you very Thank much, you. Tanya. That was, that was excellent. Really fascinating. Um, questions from the floor? Hi, can I just ask you, I really enjoy that. Um, just one of the barriers that I think that it's built up against this is just the word of disability. And did you ever consider changing that in any way or any ideas because we were thinking of doing it ourselves? <laughs> um, yes, we have. Um, we have a new name. 
currently, we have two names for faculty who are called Office for Students with Disabilities, and this is still our official name. Um, when we interact with um, students, we're called My Access. So yes, on the other hand, there are quite a few students who still identify with the term disability, so we also really do not want to take it away from them. So currently, the model of having two names works pretty well. Any more questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks very much. I thought that was very interesting. Um, just one question on some of the data that you presented mm -hmm. there about the different conditions amongst mm -hmm. your student population. We noticed a very low pr pr proportion of people with specific learning difficulties. Can you maybe explain a bit more about that? Because it'd be in Ireland, they would be about 60% of the students that would be supported in colleges by disability offices. So I was just wondering, have you another solution there? Is there more mainstream services perhaps in place? Um, you mean why we have such low numbers of students with, with it learning? Was, it was a low percent. I think it was about 16% yes, was, exactly. was the figure there. Yeah. And just, it's, it's quite different to here. And I just was wondering, is there, is there, is there a reason yeah. why? This was, this was, it was interesting yesterday because um, I heard a lot of... Um, people here talking about students with learning disabilities and I I kind of like thought that it seems that there's a big discrepancy between um, Canadian universities and European universities. Um, I'm not really sure. Um, if we look at Canadian universities in general, and McGill is not an exception, we just see